Hello, my name is Vlad, and today I'm going to tell you about Newton's first and Newton's second laws. Newton's first law states that an object will remain at rest or continue moving in a straight line with constant velocity unless a resultant force acts on it. Well, does this even make sense? Let's see. First of all, Newton's first law was actually discovered not by Newton, but by Galileo. Galileo imagined a frictionless ball and a marble. If you let go of the marble, it will continue moving until it reaches the other end, where it stops at the same height it was released. Now, if you, we make the ball longer, it still works. It continues moving until it reaches the other end where it stops. Now, Galileo imagined an infinitely long ball where there's no other end. So, once you start the ball, the ball continues moving until it reaches the other end, which it never does. So, it never stops. So, he realized that this was a natural state of an object, motion. Let's go to another example. Imagine a skydiver falling from the airplane through the air. There are two forces acting on this skydiver. First of all, it is the weight of the skydiver and second of all, it is the air resistance. When these two forces are equal, the resultant force is zero. And this means, according to Newton's first law, the skydiver will continue moving in a straight line with constant velocity. We call this velocity terminal velocity. And for a skydiver, this terminal velocity is approximately 60 meters per second. Newton's second law deals with cases where there is a resultant force. This means the forces are not balanced. Remember the skydiver. The air resistance is equal to the weight. Now, let's do another example where the forces are not balanced. Imagine a cyclist. He's cycling and providing a pushing force directed forward. And there is the resistance force, which consists of friction and air resistance and all things which makes you slow down. So, this is the push and this is the, let's call it, drag. Okay, when these two forces are equal, the cyclist continues moving in a straight line with constant velocity, according to Newton's first law. But what happens if he starts pedaling faster? This means the push force will be increased. Well, obviously, he starts moving faster. We all know this. Now what happens if he stops pedaling? This means the push force is now reduced to zero. Well, in this case, obviously, he starts slowing down. This means he decelerates. So now we are ready to state Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that force is equal to mass times acceleration. But what we need to understand here that this force means resultant force. So we're gonna put a little r here which means this is the resultant force. And in this case the resultant force is equal to the drag, since there are no other forces. In the first scenario, when he was pedaling, the resultant force is equal to the push force minus the drag force. Q 
keep that in mind when you do this. Actually, I would recommend you rewriting the Newton's second law in this way. Acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Once again, resultant force. This shows us that not acceleration causes force, but force causes acceleration. So whenever there is acceleration, there is a force. Not just a force, it's a resultant force, which means it's unbalanced. So, since acceleration is resultant force divided by mass, let's get to this example. This is a bus, and the engine is providing a forward pushing force of, well, let's say, 3,000 newtons. Now, there is a friction force opposite to the motion, which is equal to 2,500 newtons. So, the resultant force, obviously, is equal to 500 newtons. So, what is the acceleration of this bus? Simple. Acceleration is equal to resultant force divided by mass, which is 2000. So, acceleration is 500 divided by 2000 kilograms, which makes it 0 0.25 meters per second squared. And so we have the Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. Or, better, if you write acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Once again, I remind you, R as resultant force. When speaking of resultant force, you need to remember this all the time. Now, when doing problems on Newton's second law, the most difficult thing is to find the resultant force, because once you find the resultant force, you know the acceleration of the body. So, I'm going to show you a couple of examples where you will need to find the resultant force. Let's start with an easy example. There is a body, let's say a box, and there are a couple of forces acting on this box. Well, let's say it's the weight of the box, which is equal to 40 newtons, there's the normal reaction of the table, which is pushing the box upwards, not letting the box fall down, which is also 40 newtons. Now, somebody is pushing the box with a force of 80 newtons, and there is a friction force between the box and the table, which is equal to 30 newtons. How to find the resultant force here? Well, we see that the vertical forces are balanced, so there's zero resultant force in the vertical direction. Now, horizontally, we see that there's 80 and 30. Well, obviously, the resultant force is equal to 50 newtons, and since force is a vector, you need to state the direction. So, 50 newtons to the right. And now, knowing the mass of the box, say the mass of the box is 5 kilograms, you can easily find the acceleration. So acceleration of the box is equal to resultant force divided by mass, which is 50 newtons divided by 5 kilograms, and this is equal to 10 meters per second squared. So far, we have discussed two Newton's laws. First Newton's law states that an object continues moving in a straight line with constant velocity unless a force acts on it. If the body is at rest, it will stay at rest until a force acts on it. Well, this means that Motion is not caused by a force, motion is changed by a force. But the second Newton's law states pretty much the same thing. It says that acceleration 
is equal to resultant force divided by mass of the body. And if we consider the resultant force being zero, this means that the acceleration of the body is zero. And if the acceleration of the body is zero, this means either the velocity is constant or it is zero, in which case it's also constant. So, if resultant force is zero, acceleration is zero. And this means that the velocity is constant. So basically, the first Newton's law is pretty much the second Newton's law, considering the resultant force being zero. So do we really need the Newton's first law? Well, actually, we don't. But the scientists of the 17th century were so amazed to learn the fact that motion is possible without a force that they decided to keep it. And that's all what I wanted to tell you about the Newton's first two laws. The next lecture will be about Newton's third law. Thank you, goodbye.